This is BBC Two, and now Jeremy Paxman with Newsnight. And I deeply disapproved of his own attitude to politics, which is to put image making first. The devastating verdict on David Cameron, not from an enemy, but from one of his own MPs. Tonight, the decision by the Tory MP Quentin Davis to abandon his party and join Gordon Brown's has embarrassed and irritated the Conservatives and delighted Labour. But look at these two men. What on earth do they have in common? I'll be asking Mr Davis what's got into him. BAE arms sales, how American investigators are boldly going where the Brits dare not go. Goodbye Westminster, hello Jerusalem. Can Blair really expect the Middle East to trust him? Oh, hold on. I'm going to see that. Morning, Gordon. I'm following your campaign. I'm James. And what happened when a filmmaker set out to get to know Gordon Brown? Gordon, please can I ask you a question? Gordon, please may I ask you a question? Gordon, please. Gordon. Gordon, please can you answer one of my questions? Gordon? Good evening. It may be a bit like going marlin fishing and ending up with a pilchard, but Gordon Brown's trumpeting of the defection of the Tory MP Quentin Davis is an achievement of sorts. It's true that Mr Davis may not exactly be a household name, but the spleen in his resignation letter, the accusation that David Cameron stands for just about nothing, makes up for it. Before we hear from Mr Davis and a disgusted Tory MP, David Grossman reports. <laughs> The whole political world has been desperate for a peek at Gordon's grid, his plans for the days ahead. We're expecting some big announcements and today we got one. On the matter of timing, Quentin Davis is a quintessential Conservative, apart from being far more pro-European than many of his colleagues. In a coup for Gordon Brown, he chose today to defect. In his letter to the Conservative leader resigning from the party, Mr Davis is damning. Under your leadership, he writes, the Conservative Party appears to me to have ceased collectively to believe in anything or stand for anything. It has no bedrock, he writes. It exists on shifting sands. A sense of mission has been replaced by a PR agenda. This, in his view, he says, ought to exclude you, Mr Cameron, from the position of national leadership to which you aspire. I've tried to set it out as, as clearly and openly as I can in that letter. Uh, clearly, it's been a decision that I've been mulling over for months. Uh, and as I said, as the weeks went by, it became more and more clear to me that the only possible honest conclusion for me was to actually say, I, I don't belong in the Conservative Party, uh, I do belong in the Labour Party. I believe in what they're trying to do and I want to join them and I want to support them. Quentin Davis has come into frequent conflict with his party on Europe, on nuclear power and most recently on conservative calls for an immediate inquiry into the Iraq war. That the only sensible course if he is going to have an inquiry is after the last troops have been pulled out of Iraq. Uh, no, I don't agree with that at all. He's always been regarded as a bit of a maverick, a little bit semi-detached from the mainstream of the party, but I don't think many people would have thought that he would be the first uh, to defect to the Labour Party, because on many issues he's actually quite right-wing, particularly on social issues. Such as? Well, I think he, he's voted against gay rights straight down the line. Well, that's not going to find him very many friends in the Labour Party. The past couple of months have not been good for David Cameron. The row over grammar schools added to a growing sense among some in his party that he's not making the coherent progress he should be. It's an indication that in the short term, the Conservative Party's got to face a brown honeymoon and it's got to sort of batten down the hatches. And I think in that respect, after the grammar school row, there has been uh, you know, a, little, a little shakiness and I think this is a reflection of that. But beyond the, sh the very short term, I think we'll realise it doesn't matter very much. The cameras and the lights have all been set up, ready for tomorrow's events. And today's defection was, in a sense, all about setting the scene for Gordon Brown's premiership. One defection, here or there, doesn't really make a lot of difference to the long-term progress of a party. But what Mr Brown is trying to do is engage the Conservatives on the battleground of his choosing. And that battleground is substance. Gordon Brown's offer to voters is that he's a man of unparalleled experience and depth, in direct contrast, he says, to David Cameron. In his resignation letter, Quentin Davis praises Mr Brown as someone who he's always admired. 
It has a superb leader who is straightforward, who has a remarkable track record, and it offers a, a, a vision for the future of the country, which I personally believe in. If Quentin Davis has, as he says, always admired Gordon Brown, up to now he's managed to hide that admiration pretty well. The Chancellor is beginning to become, because of this self-congratulation and because of this complacency, I think he's beginning to become so cut off. Uh, that he actually begins to uh, underestimate the intelligence of the electorate. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, when uh, politicians underestimate the intelligence of the electorate, uh, in a, a democracy worthy of the name, uh, something nasty happens to them. Uh, and I trust and believe that something nasty uh, will happen to the Chancellor electorate uh, before too long. And I think he will have <laughs> no one but himself to blame. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today has been a good day for Gordon Brown and a bad one for the Conservatives. In politics, momentum is crucial. And today's defection means that Gordon Brown sails towards his big day tomorrow with the wind at his back. Quentin Davis is with us now, as is her fellow former Tory MP, Alan Duncan. Um, you know what they're saying about you. They're I can saying imagine. You're going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> you are, aren't you? Of course not, Jeremy. Of so it's considered not. judgment, is it? Of course it's a very considered judgment. It's something I've been thinking about for some months, agonising over, if you like, uh, and making very clear that I knew what I was doing before I made the change. That's why I spent a lot of time talking to Gordon Brown and making sure that my perception of the Labour Party that he was going to lead was indeed the right one. I'm uh, sure it is. And when you said today that you have always greatly admired him, he has a towering record. I mean, is your memory going? No, on the contrary. I always have well, admired him. Two just years ago, you said he was completely you, you, imprudent. Do you no, want me to recite it all? No, no, no. Prudent, incompetent, Jeremy, naive, incomplacent. No, you, you, you found a very good clip just then. I congratulate no, you. It's a different funny. clip. Well, mate, you can find other ones. Listen, we're in the House of Commons. We're debating each other the whole time. Oh, so and we're not supposed to believe what you say in the uh, House of Commons? On the contrary, on the contrary, but but on the contrary, but, but of course there have been times when I disagreed well, with Gordon Brown. Well, uh, naive, been... incompetent, complacent. Well, uh, I, I can't... now you say he's got a towering record. Well, he certainly has got a towering record. He certainly has got a towering record. You look at the British economy for the last ten years, and uh, Jeremy, over that time, sometimes. I have been right in recognising that his, his virtues. For example, but, I supported him when he made the Bank of England independent, which Alan and the rest of my party voted against. But, and but sometimes, nonetheless, you've called him complacent, naive and incompetent. Jeremy, and sometimes I got, I read the British economy wrong and Gordon read it right. I thought, indeed... Oh, so I'd, you were the one who was talking I nonsense. Yes, that has happened. I have made mistakes of judgment. Uh, about Do you think the, today about might the be one of them? No, I don't, because that was a matter of an economic judgment, which anybody right. in the course of their career will sometimes call the, 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 the rate of growth of the economy wrong or indeed fiscal policy wrong. Gordon has an extraordinary so, record of having got it right for the last 10 years. Very few human beings can do that. And, and uh, in fact, there had been times when I thought that Gordon was going to break his golden rule, but he never did. So in that respect, I was wrong. and I'm happy to put my hand on my heart and say that. Uh, and, and he was right. Uh, he's right about one thing. He's right about your leader not standing for anything, isn't he? No, it's the one thing he's wrong about, actually, because I can well, list a whole range of policies. And the fact, although he says he's spin and no substance, and by the way, he said that on many more occasions about Gordon Brown than he ever, ever has about David Cameron, the not. issue which has driven him out of the party is primarily Europe, which, of course, is a policy. It's a stand. So how can he say he doesn't stand for anything and then resigns because of the stand he's made? Work that one out. Well, the policy on Europe, of course, has been facing both ways. So David Cameron comes uh, to power, winning a leadership election, promising to pull out of the EPP. He then comes to power, he doesn't pull out of the EPP. He says one sort of thing to what to me, one, another. So you'd uh, rather thing he pull out of the EPP. Another, <laughs> another set of things to another group of people. Uh, he's been doing that on Europe, but on many other things as well. Look, let's, this, uh, the fact of the matter is that, that, that David Cameron does not sadly have what um, what great men have, like Gordon Brown, I may say, which is a consistent record of standing by certain firm. Why don't principles. we look at what's really happened? And, today. and that is a fact, Alan, which you All just right. can't get away. What has really happened today? Okay. What I think has really happened is that uh, uh, this is a political stunt. That's fine. It's going to be annoying and a short-term nuisance for us. I actually think it's going to be a long-term embarrassment for Labour because Quentin Davis is not a natural bedfellow with the Labour Party. I've got reams of quotes here where he's, he's absolutely lambasted Gordon Brown and all of this sucking up today is saying he's the most fantastic person well. in the world. I think most people will see through. The fact is he is socially illiberal. Uh, he doesn't like the green agenda being advocated by David Cameron, and none of this will sit happily in the Labour Party. This looks like someone who has re realised that he's not going to be successful in the Labour Party. 
in the Conservative Party, not going to be successful in the Labour Party, are they? Make up they, your mind. They, they'll Make chew up your mind. Well, actually, all. it's both, because they'll, <laughs> they'll chew you up and they'll spit you out within six months. They're using you. And this is a man who's being used as a political stunt, and all of the stuff we're hearing well, about propaganda and spin is actually pretty sick, because that's what we're seeing today in how the Labour Party is using Quentin Davis. Well, Alan, uh, you know, when Central Office decided to dredge you up, to come and insult me on television, they should have... They <laughs> should have they I should've, leapt at the opportunity. They, they, I offered they, myself they, in they two They really seconds. should have told you to at least come up with some intelligent and some plausible criticisms. Mm -hmm. Now, a stunt. Why would I have thrown away my career, thrown away a lovely constituency, which I'm very fond of, for a stunt, for a 24-hour stunt? Of course, I would not do that. I would not have done this uh, if, if I hadn't felt that it was the only honest thing to do in, in, the, the, light of, is in the light of the views that I'd come to. Just, just one Europe? second. I can tell you it would have been very comfortable and very oh, easy awesome. for me to have stayed in the Conservative Party. I could have fought the next election completely falsely, of course, saying, you know, what a wonderful guy right, David Cameron one. was and how wonderful the Conservative Party was. David Cameron wasn't leading so the party. what's the issue? Is it Europe uh, primarily? And, and, and uh, I decided I couldn't possibly do that. But that was not the comfortable way. Please believe that. That yeah, was actually a very difficult is way. Is it primarily Europe? There, the, the issue is even more fundamental than that. The issue is your whole approach to politics, is whether or not you do have certain firm principles, whether you do believe in consistency, whether you do believe in frankness with the electorate, or whether you try and, and, and face both ways, uh, whether in fact you just go in for an Should endless series what we've done? of image-making stuff. And as for your point about the environment, you are totally wrong. It's the other way around. Uh -huh. If you and David Cameron really cared about glo global warming, you wouldn't reject nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the only possible solution for a base load at a time when all the other forms of base load generation involve, involve well, carbon let me emissions. That so this is a, this okay, is a, a fundamental, this is a fundamental contradiction right, let him in your policy let him, let him, let him on, let on, on nuclear power. I've written the party's energy policy. Yes, I know, and it's the wrong one. Well, well you obviously <laughs> haven't read it. Because everything that the nuclear sector wants for an opportunity to invest is contained in our policy. And you know what, tonight I even had no. dinner with some people from the nuclear sector who are perfectly content with what we've said. But, but I, I don't deny your capacity or that of David to say one thing to one group of people and one thing to another. I've experienced far too is. much of that in the party over the last year, far, far too much. But may I remind you that that paper you referred to referred to nuclear energy as a last resort, a last resort, and that's not a rejection of nuclear energy as a central solution to global warming. I don't know what is. Well, we are pushing as far as we can for as much renewable energy in order to champion the green last agenda. Resort, what, but the what last resort. You what didn't deny the phrase, and the phrase is in that paper. You voted against the fox hunting ban. You voted against gay adoption. You voted against tuition fees, didn't you, for university students? Uh, uh, yes, All indeed. of which are well, Labour Party policy. Oh, no, 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 the first two are free votes. The first two are generally free votes. I mean, come on. You know that as well as I do. Uh, oh, so the, you're perfectly uh, at home in this party, are you? Well, I mean, a free vote is a free vote. It's not a matter of a party political agenda. That's what a free vote means. You know even better than I do what a free vote means, Jeremy. You've been around in politics even longer than Alan and myself, I think. So you know what a free vote is. That's not a party political matter. You said that you were elected... <laughs> I'm finding it very difficult to keep a straight face. I'm sorry. I can see that. Um, <laughs> you said, um, you've conceded, that you were elected by the people of Grantham uh, as a Conservative. Grantham Stamford, yeah. Are you going to have the guts to let them see whether they will vote for you as a Labour MP? Well, I, I thought about that, standing at the next election as a Labour mm. MP, but it's a difficult decision to take, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because I would be inevitably campaigning against some people uh, who've that supported me in the past and canvassed for me in the past. It's a very difficult human situation. Mm. And obviously some people are very upset about my decision. Some mm. people support it. Some people have supported it today. But some people, I understand, uh, are very upset. I don't Why wish to make... Some people I don't wish to socks off to precisely, get you precisely, Parliament. Precisely, Jeremy. So I don't want to, I don't want to exacerbate that anguish by uh, fighting the next election um, for a different party. Can and I that's what I would do. Well, you could just so that is why... I've got a very constructive suggestion. I mean, he's going to suggest, of course, I jump in the nearest leg. I know that. No, no. Uh, but I've got absolutely. a much better proposal. <laughs> Given the unique circumstances we face today, in which Tony Blair has said that tomorrow he will stand down as an MP, why don't you stand down in Stamford? and stand in Sedgefield. Well, that's extremely kind of you. Are you representing the electors of Sedgefield in saying that? No, but I don't think you would either. <laughs> are well, you, uh, we will see. <laughs> I, generally, I, I've decided today to, to make the decision that, I, that you were talking about, uh, and I haven't decided what to do at the next election, mm. but uh, I do intend to stay in public life, as I made clear in that, in that, uh, in that letter. Will you I give an undertaking tonight that on no circumstances will you accept a peerage from the Labour government? 
I'm not giving any undertakings tonight, but I'm certainly not interested in peerages. Uh, and frankly, Alan, if you knew anything about my record, you'd know that I have a consistent record in voting for a 100% Democratic elected House of Lords for the abolition of the nominated House of Lords, which I think is completely wrong. I want a Democratic chamber. So if I was myself <laughs> hoping for some nomination of the House of Lords, I'd hardly been doing that, would I? Before we wrap up this uh, cat fight, um, <laughs> oh, no, can you uh, <laughs> tell us whether there are other Conservative MPs who are thinking along the lines you're thinking? Well, I can tell you certainly, Jeremy, there are a very large number of Conservative MPs who share my concerns, my anxieties, my fundamental analysis of what's going wrong in the Tory party. But for very honourable reasons and very understandable reasons, probably uh, they don't want to necessarily say that in public. And right you now. know perfectly I... well there are. He's right. There are people in your party, because we all hear them, saying precisely this sort of thing. I don't think that's right, but I'll tell you what I think has really happened. The Conservative Party has changed. Quentin Davis is old-fashioned and doesn't like it. He's not prepared to change with it. Well, you know, this is just, a, just another bit of sort of image. You know, you can't address the arguments or you've lost the arguments, so you say someone's old-fashioned. You find some derogatory adjective or dismissive adjective, and he thinks old-fashioned is a suitable dismissive adjective. So we're back to this business of not actually facing up the substance and facing up to the issues. And Alan, in that respect, is representing very well the very sad picture of the modern Conservative Party. Thank you both very much. <laughs>